I'm so glad to have Lauren Kalatney from Acre Capital with us here today. Before we get into it, Lauren, could you tell me a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, I'm happy to. So uh, I studied economic development undergrad, and my first job out of college was actually with the Clinton Foundation. I was doing technology partnerships based in India. Mm -hmm. uh, this was prior to 2008, and I saw a lot of the early entrepreneurial activity around mobile money that was happening at that mm -hmm. time and became really excited about the idea that fintech could drive financial inclusion around the world. So that kind of got me into the space. Uh, I then spent a couple years at Google in product marketing, where I worked on what was then the Google Apps team. So uh, repackaging the consumer apps for business. Mm -hmm. I led the Google Drive launch and a number of others. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after graduating from business school, I joined uh, my now uh, co-founder and co-managing partner, Teresa Gao, along with a couple of our other co-founders to um, initially at Aspect Ventures, and then we started Acre Capital in, in 2019. That's a really interesting entree into the space, by the way, uh, an interest in like mobile money and like more of the social development, social good aspect. What caused you guys to want to branch out and found Acre? Uh, we, we had been working together as a team for uh, two funds at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And as a group, we really just had a shared philosophy about the kind of venture firm that we wanted to build. Um, so we decided to, to do that under this under this brand with a real emphasis on collaboration. And that's why our name is A Crew with an emphasis on crew. We obviously right. like accruing value for our LPs as well. But, <laughs> but you um, also like to be a crew. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're, we're more collaborative in that sense. And I think that that's really become a big part of our ethos as a firm. Is there a specific investment thesis that you are really guided by with respect to your funds, or is it more of a space-specific investment portfolio? How does it work? Yeah, so we're very thesis-driven as a firm. We have four verticals where we spend most of our time, but okay. FinTech is our largest, and that's where I spend all of my time. So, um, you know, I think that the uh, interest in financial inclusion that I mentioned kind of led me originally back um, when we were still at Aspect to, to build out a thesis around an opportunity for uh, digital first banking because okay. I had seen, you know, uh, a bunch of, well, I'd seen millennials uh, enter the workforce during the recession and become inherently distrustful of legacy financial institutions. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, they'd grown up as digital natives. And so it seemed intuitive to me that a digital first bank could exist. Mm -hmm. um, and that led me to uh, one of our first fintech investments, which was the Series A2 in Chime, which I led. Uh, and I've been uh, in, in various board roles there ever since. So, um, so that kind of sparked us off. Right. And, and we've built out a pretty uh, robust portfolio ever since then. So you started out with a neobank investment. What other stuff within the fintech space are you interested in and currently looking at? Currently, uh, a number of things. I would say I think that they're you know kind of coming back to the roots that I mentioned uh, from early on in my career, I really believe right now is an interesting time to see um, opportunities in emerging markets where I think, uh, you know, populations around the world, both individuals as well as organizations, are leapfrogging traditional financial, the traditional financial sector in favor mm -hmm. of fintech. I think that's a massive opportunity. So I've made a couple investments, as an example, in, in Latin America, one in a company called Clar, um, which is also a challenger bank uh, in Mexico and has mm -hmm. become the leader in that space, um, as well as a company called La House, which is a residential real estate marketplace in Spanish-speaking LATAM that has quickly become the largest prop tech in that region. Um, and you know, uh, in one case, uh, Clar is really trying to bring people into the banking system, and La House is uh, enabling uh, folks to have access to home ownership. Um, and I think these are good examples of the opportunities that I believe exist there. So that's actually really interesting, the introduction of banking and banking related services in international markets, especially when you're dealing with a customer who has never, ever had a checking account yep. before. What other trends and what other headwinds are you seeing in fintech outside of the United States, specifically in developing markets? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, really, we're seeing opportunities across the board, mm -hmm. um, you know, new categories of lending that are arising, for example, you know, uh, HELOC loans have never really been very accessible in Latin America, and we're starting mm -hmm. to see activity there, new opportunities around mortgages, but also at the same time, a lot of new infrastructure to support these companies. And so we're right. seeing a lot of API and data layer companies coming about to, to really enable uh, the application layer companies that exist. It's, it's really a lot of what we've seen in the US, uh, but tailored to a different market and happening 
candidly at a faster faster pace. In, in my view, it took us about 10 to 15 years for consumer fintech to come become large enough um, that you saw all this financial infrastructure start to really open up. Right. In, in LATAM and, and in emerging markets around the world, it's happening much more quickly. And so there's a, there's a big opportunity there as well. Do you think the primary driver of that, like the thing that's coming to mind immediately is like M-Pesa in Uganda or the idea that like digital currency was so much more amenable to yes. develop, you know, uh, developing markets. Mm -hmm. Is that the primary driver? Is there something else going on that I may be missing? I just think that uh, in many of these markets, you know, uh, the uh, the legacy financial sector has not figured out how to serve the mass market. Um, they've 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 typically served a higher end consumer, right. higher end enterprise, and right. um, and technology enables you to scalably um, and cost effectively serve a larger audience um, and and a larger audience that has been traditionally left behind, and so. That's, I think, really at the root of it. Got it. So what I'm hearing is that there's actually a benefit to the lack of credit availability, the lack of services in these developing markets, and that is that you don't have to be bogged down by all of the negative stuff that comes with legacy infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, you're you're not having to pull people away from from legacy services as much, right? I mean, right. they're they're looking for the entry point into the financial sector, and and these fintechs are. Are serving uh, serving that purpose. We're also seeing, um, you know, another theme that we're really excited about um, is the convergence of of CFI and DeFi. And one mm -hmm. of the ways I think this is interesting, particularly in the markets that we're just discussing, mm -hmm. is um, you're starting to see some new infrastructure that can really enable um, things like cross border payments, um, which have been very painful traditionally mm -hmm. uh, with with legacy infrastructure. So I, I also think that's going to start to to play a bigger role. Tell me more about the intersection between CFI and DeFi. Yeah, so I think you know, uh, it, it really we've seen a number of um, crypto companies obviously come up over the past five plus years that have been much more centralized. We're obviously seeing a, a number of new and interesting mm -hmm. uh, players that are that are squarely um, in in DeFi, and what we're now seeing is. Uh, yeah, a like a hybrid model. Yeah, a hybrid model, and 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 candidly, more traditional fintechs um, that are starting to adopt, you know, crypto strategies. Right. Um, and so it's it's just been interesting to see a lot of the existing portfolio mm -hmm. uh, that have come to some level of maturity uh, and were not previously playing in that space, starting to get really serious about developing strategies there. And so I think I just think you know for a long time, um, fintech and uh, and the crypto kind of entrepreneurial ecosystems were somewhat separate right. and they're really starting to converge, um, right. which I think is a, is a good thing because right. I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned from, from the fintech experience um, that can be applied to, to crypto where you know it's obviously a little more wild west right now, but right. there's so many opportunities and I think that the learnings um, you know, can bring a lot to bear. Right. And plus, when you have a more of a hybrid model, you're not, you know, mitigating or you're not giving up the benefits of centralization to be more decentralized and you're not giving up the benefits of decentralization to be centralized. Yeah. Right. Yep. Interesting. What other trends are you seeing? I know that you focus on fintech and that's your spe specialty at your fund. What other overar overarching themes are you seeing, overarching trends are you seeing in the space? Yeah. Um, so we're seeing uh, we're seeing really so. I think that we've heard a lot over the past couple of years around the opportunity in embedded finance, and you know that that is a trend that I believe in. I think the most interesting opportunities there, though, are companies that are really building in embedded finance from the ground up. Meaning, um, they build a company that is you know offering some interesting consumer application or B two B application, um, and mindful of the fact that they will monetize on some sort of financial service. And so the whole thing is architected to support that. So one example is a company called Paceline, which is uh, one of our portfolio companies at Acro. And Paceline uh, basically does um, uh, fitness tracking. They plug into your, uh, you know, your Apple Watch or your IoT device, and they track they track fitness, um, and they incentivize you to exercise um, mm -hmm. using rewards. Um, they just launched a credit card, and so the uh, rewards are augmented right. by <laughs> credit card usage. Um, but it's a really interesting kind of, it's it's the alignment around financial health and physical health, which right. Paceline has created because they were so mindful about how they wanted to do it from day one. Right. Is, is pretty interesting, um, and they're able to distribute, 
using this uh, using this health and wellness application, which is far more scalable, uh, mm -hmm. and and acquisition is you know largely organic and driven through TikTok and other means, mm -hmm. and then and then they upsell people on a credit card um, without having to compete, you know, with sort of traditional credit card providers. And so I think right. it's a I think it's a pretty interesting um, example of embedded a, of, of embedded embedded fintech being kind of built in from the ground up, and one that I think we'll see a lot of in the coming coming year or two. Interesting. I know you guys recently led the Series A in Lolly. Tell me more about that investment. Yeah. So this is a really good, I think, example of this um, convergence of kind of. DeFi and DeFi in a way. So Lolly is a Bitcoin rewards company mm -hmm. where um, consumers across the internet can use their mobile app or their Chrome extension while uh, purchasing online to earn rewards in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we were so attracted to the opportunity, in addition to the caliber of the founders who are repeat founders and sold their last business to Rakuten and know this uh, space very well, um, is that it's really a, a opportunity to democratize access uh, mm. to Bitcoin and to crypto for a more mass market and specifically for women. So, um, you know, there's uh, unfortunately the data, as we know, in, in crypto blockchain is limited. But, you know, a lot of the um, uh, sort of speculative data around uh, the sort of demo of uh, crypto uh, holders is, is, you know, it's 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 vast male. majority male. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, some say it's as little as four percent is owned by women. Wow. Um, and so you know, I think a big part of that is, um, you know, you have to go deep in many cases to really engage with this stuff. And so something that really eases access, onboarding, lowers risk, uh, means that people can more casually engage. And so uh, Lolly is a way for. Um, for you know, average Americans to start to create a Bitcoin wallet um, as they shop without right. having to put up, you know, capital um, of their own uh, that it, that is as at risk, and in doing so, they become educated and learn, and it's an interesting on ramp for folks. Right. It's interesting because if I'm understanding correctly, this actually dovetails on two different trends, the embedded finance trend that you were talking about earlier yep. and the crypto trend. Yep. And it actually is the perfect segue, since it's female focused, into something else I wanted to ask you about, yeah. which is your diversity and your inclusion initiatives. Yeah. So when we founded the firm, I mentioned we had a really collaborative strategy. But we also um, decided that one of our core values from, from early days was that uh, we wanted to uh, Really embrace diversity of perspective. So right. we've we've built that into our team. Um, uh, Seventy percent of us are either women and/or underrepresented minorities. Ninety percent, if you expand that definition to include people of color, mm -hmm. um, and we all come from different backgrounds. And you know th that was very important to us in building our team. But recently, uh, with the launch of our new funds, which puts a crew at uh, nearly a billion under management in uh, less than two years. Um, we've created what we call a crew of leaders, which mm -hmm. is um, 500 diverse operators and executive leaders mm -hmm. in their field uh, mm -hmm. who have signed up and joined us to be part of this community and support our companies. And so, uh, and so our companies can draw on this community for you know talent if they're searching for independent board members mm -hmm. or executives. Um, they can work with them as advisors or they can tap into them for partnerships and customer relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and what's really cool is that uh, about 300 of them mm -hmm. actually invested in one of our funds, um, which is our Diversify Capital Fund. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a growth stage participatory fund mm -hmm. um, where we write checks of 10 to $15 million typically. Mm -hmm. uh, and 70% of that capital in a $300 million fund mm -hmm. comes from diverse LPs. So wow. from these, for these growth stage investor or growth stage founders, it's an opportunity to one, add meaningful diversity to their cap table with a mm -hmm. single check. Mm -hmm. And two, and this is true for our early stage founders as well, but mm -hmm. draw on this, this community of people that are there to support them. So we're really proud of, of, of that work and um, really excited about the caliber of people that have, that have joined us in this initiative. Wow, those stats, both with respect to your diversity fund and your employ employment metrics just are truly astounding. Thanks. Yeah. You've well, done a great job with that. I, you know, it's it, it it honestly it happened naturally, but we're really proud of the of the yeah. team that we've built, and we're and we're really proud of this of this group. Of you leaders. should be. I mean, I'm sure it happened naturally, but you can't do something like that unless you have a very purposeful, conscientious focus on that. 
Um, well, we uh, it's something we all care about deeply. It's, it's been a passion for a long time, and we decided it was time to really take a, a deliberate strategy on this dimension. Really impressive. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Thank you.